Hello and welcome to the Civil War Project, where I'm retracing Civil War history one person, place, and event at a time. Today I'll be recapping episode 2, titled Postmortem, from the limited series Manhunt on Apple TV+. Be sure to check out my episode 1 recap if you haven't already. The link is in the description. Like I did for episode 1, I will just be sticking to the story the creators chose to tell, which doesn't mean it actually happened. I'll be posting future videos on what is fact, what is fiction, and what is in between, so you can know the complete story. If you're interested, be sure to hit the subscribe and notification button so you don't miss it. So, let's talk Manhunt, Episode 2. We start out by seeing a jubilant, slow-motioned evening at Ford's Theater. We see the elegant Ellen Stanton getting out of a carriage, followed by actor Harry Hawk delivering his lines from Our American Cousin. As President Abraham Lincoln gives a full-hearted laugh, a pistol slowly comes into sight and aims. As the pistol gets closer to Lincoln's head, we see Secretary of War Edwin Stanton grab the assassin's arm and a struggle ensues. Stanton manages to seize the gun and wrestles the assassin John Wilkes Booth to the ground. Stanton takes a fist to Booth's face, trying to deliver a blow that will either knock Booth out or maybe even kill him, but it's useless. Booth not only takes each blow, but he just can't stop laughing. Stanton doesn't get it, but Booth does. As Stanton tells Booth that he's a failure, Booth gives the kind of primal yell that soldiers would do in the field of battle during the Civil War. And with that, we find Stanton shaken out of his trance. He's sitting at his desk at the War Department. He's devastatingly not the hero he envisions he could have been if he had not rejected the President's invitation to go with him and Mary at Ford's. The whole thing unnerves Stanton, who struggles to catch his breath, which is really not a great thing for a guy with asthma. I love how they included this, as there were many people who were invited to sit with the President and Mary that evening, and they likely reenacted a similar scene in their minds, thinking about how if they had gone, the President could still be alive. It's the day after the assassination at the Telegraph office at the War Department, and it's all hands on deck. Thomas Eckert, one of the hunters, tells Stanton that they have interviewed the cast of Our American Cousin, the staff at Ford's, and the Seward House, and it has produced zero leads as to where Booth might be. It's odd that they would ask the Seward family and their household staff, because it was Lewis Powell who had stabbed, hit, and punched his way through the house in an attempt to kill Secretary of State William Seward. Maybe they should get some experienced detectives on this. Stanton's son Willie comes in and says they found the guy who rented Booth his horse that he escaped on. He also suggests that his father get a guard. As Stanton stares down his son, Willie can't help but look towards Eckert, and then you understand that it's Eckert's idea. Stanton says he can take care of himself, and I can't blame him. Given the job that Lincoln's guard Parker did the night of the play, I wouldn't see the point either. A man in a U.S. military uniform storms into the War Department office in New York City and starts barking orders at a bunch of extras. The main objective, find John Wilkes Booth and his conspirators. He and another gentleman start having a conversation, and it's here that we learn of their identities. Detective Lafayette Baker and his cousin Lieutenant Luther Byron Baker. These are two more hunters. Oddly, the guy wearing the military uniform is the detective. It appears that Luther works for his cousin, often doing menial work, but this time he is told that he's going to be Lafayette's eyes and ears inside the 16th Cavalry from New York, which Lafayette is taking down to Washington so they can hunt down Booth. Lafayette's clever, you see. Stanton put him in charge of hiring the lead investigators, which means he won't be able to collect the reward money when they find Booth. But hey, if his cousin acts like a big tattletale, then the money stays within the family which is really code for, you get the money, then I take all the money from you, and then I give you a tiny amount for your part. Luther doesn't get that though, as he comments how he's already spending that reward. Next, we're back with Stanton and his son interviewing an unnamed stableman who tells Stanton that Booth rented two horses, one from him and another for David Harold. He knows Harold well, as he usually rents horses to go hunting. The poor guy not only has to worry about being connected with those two, but we learn that his horses were never returned. Then Eckert comes in and tells Stan that he needs to get to the Kirkwood House, where the Supreme Court is waiting to swear in Vice President Andrew Johnson as president. Stanton makes the briefest micro-expression of disgust hearing Johnson's name. Stanton leaves his son to take the statement, and Eddie reminds him that he's to meet Ellen, Stanton's wife, at the cemetery. 
They don't tell you this, but Ellen is Eddie's stepmother, as his birth mother died in 1844, which is why he doesn't call her mother. Eckhart comes in again and says that Johnson isn't answering, and an exasperated Stanton tells Eddie to tell Ellen that he's sorry, and at that point I realize they all have names that start with the letter E. An agitated Stanton hears his name called for the 50 millionth time, and the guy looks like he's about to lose it. Here we see Louis Weichmann. You don't know the name yet, but I'm giving it now. He was the guy in the odd uniform that we saw coming down the stairs of Mary Surratt's Washington boarding house in the first episode, who was observing assassin Lewis Powell getting on his coat with the help of conspirator Mary Surratt. The guy comes across a little squirrely, no, no offense to squirrels of course, but manages to say that he thinks he knows who might have conspired with Booth and it's his landlady. Well, I guess Stanton must have realized that maybe there was something to this and the guy wasn't just trying to get out of rent. So we now cut to Mary Surratt's boarding house in Washington, where Eckhart is interrogating Mrs. Surratt while Weichmann watches. She says that she lent Booth cooking utensils. Actors on the road need cooking utensils, right? She says, my story is the truth, which makes me think of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle and how they're always talking about their truth, when in reality their truth rarely matches up with anyone else's truth. Next, Mrs. Surratt will be saying the cookware was part of Meghan's new lifestyle line too. It's all about the truth with her. Then there is a loud knock on the door and Eckhart tells Mary to answer it. Then a very rough looking Lewis Powell enters as he holds a pickaxe saying, I didn't know where else to go. His face is dirty and he's still wearing the blood-stained coat. Okay, so everyone in the city who can read or has ears or even a brain knows that Secretary of State Seward was attacked but no one knew who it was. Here is Powell in broad daylight wandering around with his blood-stained coat and no one notices. I would shame the entire Washington population if this was factual, but it's not. Also, because Powell had left his hat back at Seward's, he has a shirt oddly wrapped around his head instead. That part is kind of true. He stole clothes off a clothesline and left his coat in a cemetery because even the real Powell knows he couldn't walk around the city in that. Why reflect half truth and half fiction here? It makes no sense to me, but the entire episode largely plays out this way. Mary pretends he's some vagrant and tells him to go, but Powell is too dense to realize what he just walked into. He apologizes for his poor excuse for a hat and takes it off. If Mrs. Surratt's in trouble, I'll come back later, says Powell. Yeah, that's not going to work. Eckhart states he's with the War Department and pulls back his coat to reveal his gun, just like we're in a Western TV show. Eckhart asks who he is, and he says that Mrs. Surratt hired him to dig a gutter. Mary swears before God that she has never seen him before in her life. If you got through episode one, you know that's a lie. To quote the former Queen Elizabeth II, recollections may vary. Weichmann then boldly points out that that's not mud on Powell's coat. Eckhart, who maybe just has poor eyesight, now realizes it's blood. Powell and Eckhart struggle while Weichmann pulls a pistol on Mary, who initially tries to flee out the back. Mary drops to her knees and starts praying. They don't mention this, but Mary is a devout Catholic. Catholics were not really accepted in society back then, so this will endear her to no one. Eckhart wins the battle and smirks that Look, you did dig a hole together. See, historical fiction can be funny. Next, we see Ellen Stanton at the grave site of James M. Stanton, born 1861, died 1862. She tells the grave site of the former eight-month-old infant that his father would be here if he could, but he was busy saving the Republic, again, and when he's done, he'll come home to them. It might seem like an odd scene, but I have a feeling that we might see Edwin Stanton's death at some point in this series. And if so, then it will make sense why this is here. Avert your eyes, people. There's a loud knock at the door as we see a man showing his backside, thankfully covered with long johns, not the donut, but the cotton drawers that some people still wear in the wintertime under their clothes, as he lay snoring on the couch. Meet your 17th president. Stanton comes in and kicks the couch a few times to wake up a very hungover Andrew Johnson. Remember in episode one when Booth was writing on the back of a calling card and left it at the Kirkwood house? It turns out it was left for Johnson. He gives it to Stanton, stating he had never even met Booth before and didn't understand it. Stanton tells him that he was marked to be assassinated, but they caught the guy. Johnson ponders why it didn't happen while he gets properly dressed, and Stanton alludes to the idea that 
maybe Johnson is in on the whole thing. Well, this is awkward. When Stanton tells him that they caught the guy, George Atzerott, right there at the Kirkwood, and that he drank so much that he lost his nerve, Johnson chuckles, so the bottle that ruined my reputation may have saved my life. They are trying so hard to fit so many details in, but I'm guessing most normal people are really lost and we're only 11 minutes in. They are just dropping these little Easter eggs, but they're all cracked and messy. Johnson was drunk during the inauguration the prior month, and that's what he's talking about. Stanton picks up a small cloth item at one point on Johnson's dresser and stares at it. It's hard to tell, but it's either clothing for an infant or a woman. I feel like this was done for a reason, but we're not meant to know why. Johnson is married, but his wife has tuberculosis and is back home in Tennessee. Stanton wants to know how all of this is going to work, and Johnson comes right out and says he cares about the economy, not black rights. Well, he's cruder than that, but I'm not repeating it. He's not about to waste his bipartisan popularity on Stanton's moral crusade. Johnson has popularity? Well, the soon-to-be president then asks where Booth is, and after he's told Booth went south, Johnson says to just let the local authorities handle it. Stanton reminds him Southern local authorities are Confederates. Has Johnson spent the entire war drunk? It turns out that Johnson looks pretty sharp in his fancy clothes, prompting Stanton to say at least he looked the part. Johnson was a professional tailor, but for some reason they have him say he was an apprentice to a tailor. Don't ask me why. Johnson looks at his fancy self with pride in the mirror right before telling Stanton to get someone in there to clean his room before the ceremony. I know Stanton is the guy that takes on a lot, but I doubt he has time to play housekeeper or track one down for that matter. John Wilkes Booth and David Harold are still at Dr. Samuel Mudd's house. They quarrel outside about what to feed the horses and whether Booth should shave off his mustache. Booth looks like he's about to punch Harold for even suggesting it. Even though Dr. Mudd has been helpful, he's not about to be overly helpful. He won't give them food for the horses, nor will he go buy any. When Booth asks Davy to go into town and buy food for the horses, and Harold's concerned about being found out, Booth's mood changes from, don't you know who I am, to childlike whimpers of, oh, please, Davy, ple please do it, please, please, maybe? You know, while giving major puppy dog eyes to someone who he will never see as his equal. Davy goes out to get the feed, only to find that Stanton has banned the selling of any feed in the entire state of Maryland. He wants those horses Booth and Harold stole to drop from hunger. Score one for Stanton. As Harold heads back, he starts to ponder how the heck he even got here, which leads to a flashback from a year ago. Harold was working as a druggist when a strange man comes in. It's John Surratt Jr., who is Mary Surratt's son. This guy reminds me of a guy in a cheap murder mystery video game who acts all secretive, but it's just so obvious that he's the one to watch out for. Surratt Jr. praises Harold for being kind and giving pain medication to Confederate soldiers, and for knowing the Maryland woods as well as he does. John goes into this weird speech about his dad being an alcoholic and dying after his mother served him his last drink, which makes him smile just to retell it. Anyway, he wants Harold to join this little group of theirs who is led by the one and only actor John Wilkes Booth. Turns out there's a poster of Harold's future escape partner promoting one of his plays on the door. It must be meant to be. As we see our 17th president being sworn in by a bunch of white-haired old guys, Stanton joins his wife, the lone woman in the room, and apologizes for not making it to the cemetery. Ellen says, it's okay. He never missed James's birthday before. Stanton tells her he misses him too. I'm not sure if Ellen's tears are for her dead son or because now Johnson is officially president. She's a smart woman though and tells her husband to fix his face. He must also give Johnson a chance. Ellen must be an optimist. Back at Dr. Mudd's, Mudd yells for his former enslaved person and now a paid, but likely poorly paid, servant, Mary Sims, to shave the patient's face. The patient being Booth, of course. Booth begins to question whether he can trust her, and Mudd says she's been under his hand since she learned to crawl. Mudd also tells Booth to be gone by the time he gets back. Booth looks a little nervous, and he should be. Think about how many times an enslaved person had to shave the face of their enslaver. 
It makes one realize the constant decisions an enslaved person had to make. Hmm, do I, do I cut the throat of my enslaver and hope I can run far enough away to avoid being hanged? I must believe that crossed their minds countless times. After Mary puts on the shaving cream and sharpens the blade, she appears to Nick Booth and of course he overreacts by grabbing the blade out of her hand and threatening to use it on her throat. He asks if she knows who he is, and she says if he's important she wouldn't know as she's only been far from there one time. Booth releases Mary and she runs out the door with Booth screaming that she's causing him worry and when he worries he puts an end to it. This sends Mary into a flashback to when she was a child, living with an older man and woman, we find out later it's an aunt and uncle, along with a teenage boy who is likely her brother. Mary and her uncle are playing cards, and the winner will get a book, but we don't see what that is. Slave hunters show up and the grown-ups arm themselves while Mary is told to hide. Mary exclaims she doesn't want to go back to Dr. Mudd's and be a slave again, and I think we can all understand where that's coming from. The slave hunters want the girl, and they threaten to take all of them. They already have four men tied up together to take back down south. It's now revealed that this is the free state of Pennsylvania, but they don't tell the viewers that the slave hunters are legal due to the Fugitive Slave Act in 1850. Slave hunters are allowed to snatch African Americans from free states. It's also not uncommon for them to snatch a genuinely free man off the street and send him south. Then the white folks of the area show up, telling the slave hunters they are abolitionists. If the hunters thought they were getting help, they are wrong. Back at the White House, Stanton walks down a corridor filled with people. As Stanton enters through a second door, we see they are paying respects to Abraham Lincoln, who is dressed in a nice suit and laying on a bed. Some of them are people who had worked in the White House, and most are weeping. We then meet Elizabeth Keckley, Mary Lincoln's dressmaker and friend who bought her freedom many years ago. Elizabeth tells Stan that Mary won't make funeral arrangements and hardly speaks. In the corner of the room, dressed in black, is Mary. Mary seems a bit out of it and starts rambling that Elizabeth has 20 seamstresses working for her and that every lady wants one of her gowns. She'll be on a wait list if she wants a new funeral gown. Elizabeth reminds Mary that she's always on her list. Mary says there's no time for a new funeral gown, she'll just wear the one she wore to Willie's. Willie, the Lincoln's third child, died in February of 1862. Stanton suggests to Mary that they bury Abraham at Arlington Cemetery, Lee's land. Mary doesn't like that idea. Stanton tells her that it's not his anymore, that he's turning it into a burial ground for the Union's fallen heroes. Mary doesn't think it's appropriate. It's military. Abraham wasn't military. Stanton reminds her that he was the commander-in-chief, but Mary isn't convinced. He decides to ask her what clothes to bury her husband in, and she snaps that he never cared what he wore in his whole life, so why does Stanton think it matters now? Calling Stanton Lincoln's war wife, she puts it on him to choose the clothing. Back at Dr. Mudd's, Booth and Harold are about to leave. Harold asks once more for feed for the horses, but he's not going to get it. Mud gives them the name of Swan, a guy for hire on their side. He'll get them around the swamp to Rich Hill, where a guy will give them cover and help them on their way down the southern line to Dixie. Harold asks if there's a safer path to Richmond, at which point Mud calls for Mary to come there and give him the book she's always reading behind his back. I'm guessing this is the book she and her uncle were playing cards over. She denies she has one and then asks him not to take it before they struggle and Mud snatches the book from her pocket while all the colored eggs in the basket she was holding fall to the floor. It's a subtle reminder that this is the day before Sunday, which is also the same day Lincoln died and there's a lot going on. Mud goes to the front of the book and rips out a page that has a map titled Washington and its Environments. He draws a line across the Potomac down into Virginia and tells them to follow that. Oh, and if they are captured, swallow it. He hands it to Harold because we all know Booth certainly won't be swallowing it. Given Harold's brief expression, he knows it too. They walk out the door with a mustacheless Booth hobbling on a crutch made from Mary's broom. Booth looks over his shoulder and gives Mary this childish, I don't like you, look. The feeling is mutual. Back at the War Department, we see photos of Booth and Harold along with prisoner photos of Lewis Powell, George Atzerodt, and Ned Spangler. Detective Lafayette has arrived, telling Stanton Booth had four meetings with Wall Street men about investing in an oil rig in Pennsylvania. 
Maybe they were really talking about an assassination escape? The detective asks for the bank book Stanton found at Booth's hotel in the last episode, all while explaining how he thinks Booth is being hid by the Confederate Secret Service. Booth is a famous actor. It's the only thing that explains why no one has seen him. If the Secret Service are hiding him, did the Confederacy plan it? Who produced Booth's latest stunt, the Confederacy Wall Street? Or maybe our new president? He had the most to gain from it. Johnson could have planned it all along with a fake attempt on himself to distract everyone. Stanton's face says it all as he pours them both a drink. He would love it if it were Johnson so he could dethrone the guy. But instead, he accuses Lafayette of sounding like Mary Lincoln. Okay, I don't think that was necessary. Lafayette says, don't discount it. Everyone's thinking it. And I'm guessing there are still quite a few people, even right now, thinking Johnson had a hand in it. So he makes a good point. Later on, Eddie Stanton tells his father that he's found a file on John Surratt Jr. He applied for a job in the War Department. Surratt Jr. ran the post office in Surrattsville, Maryland, and delivered telegrams from Richmond. They even intercepted him once with a lot of money, but nothing came from it. When Stanton learns that the cavalry has searched the Surrattsville Tavern owned by Mary Surratt and they found nothing, that's just not good enough. Stanton explains that his dad hid slaves in their home all the time, and even though marshals raided them countless times, they never found anything either. Stanton grabs his coat, pipe, and deer-stalking hat. Oops, I'm sorry, I was thinking of Sherlock Holmes. He grabs his coat and stovepipe hat and tells his son to put a reward out for John Surratt Jr., half as much as Booth. Eddie's also to tell informant Weichmann that he's going to spend the afternoon with Stanton at Surrattsville as Stanton grabs a loaded revolver out of his desk. Stanton, Eckhart, and Weichmann arrive at Surrattsville and Stanton immediately starts tapping the walls. He of course has luck on his first try and pries open the wood paneled wall that hides a desk and what looks to be codes, letters, and other important papers. One is a Western Union telegram from Confederate President Jefferson Davis to John Surratt Jr. the week of the assassination that needs decoding, so he passes it to Eckert. They call Weichmann in and really rake him over the coals. The poor guy's about to cry. They don't understand why he works at the War Department, is friends with John Surratt Jr., stays at the boarding house of a conspirator, and yet claims he didn't know, see, or hear anything ever. After being pushed, he blurts out that John Jr. was his friend before the war. Didn't they have friends before the war that ended up on the other side? He makes a good point there. He swears that while John was his friend, they disagreed on a lot of things. They didn't see eye to eye on Lincoln or slavery. He swears John left town before April 14th. Stanton keeps pushing and Weichmann blurts out that he saw Mrs. Surratt pass packages to Booth, that she said they were cooking utensils, but now he believes they were guns. Which seems a little odd because I thought we kind of covered a little bit of that at the Surratt house. I don't know. He swears he has always been loyal to the department and the union. We're now at a prison where the conspirators are being held. Powell at Surratt Spangler and Mary Surratt, which is now our third Mary in the story if you're keeping track. Mary Surratt, with hay and her hair, is being interrogated by Stanton himself. This guy is really playing a lot of roles here. He keeps asking her if she wants to go home, but she just keeps refusing to answer and states over and over that they can't do this to her while weeping and rocking back and forth. Eckhart comes out of the shadows clapping, congratulating her on her acting performance, telling her that she and Booth can share a cell together and put on plays for the other inmates. Well, he really doesn't say that last part. She doesn't know where John Jr. is, and even if she did, she would never say, it's her son. Stanton orders her food rations to be cut and walks away as she screams that she wants to go home. Next up are the men who are in a cell together. Eckhart removes Atzerat and Spangler, leaving Powell on the floor. Stanton squats by him and asks Powell if he's in his right mind. Powell looks at him a second with crazy eyes and then goes back to staring the other way. Looks like the answer is no. As viewers, we don't know why Powell wouldn't be in his right mind. It certainly wasn't from when he was apprehended at the Surratt boarding house. Either we'll learn it later, or I'll just tell you that it could be a reference to when Powell repeatedly hit his head against his cell walls because he was tired of life and would rather hang than spend another minute in a courtroom. Yeah, not the jail cell, the courtroom. From what I've heard, we won't see a courtroom scene until episode 7, but it's the only thing I can think of as to what's happening here and what they're inferring to. 
Stanton's back at the War Department, and I begin to wonder, is this still happening on the same day? If so, it has to be the most productive day in the history of mankind. The informant from Episode 1, John Burroughs, who sold peanuts at Ford's Theater and held Booth's horse the night of the assassination, is at the War Department. Detective Lafayette brings him into Stanton's office. John wants to tell them that when Booth left the theater and he went towards his horse, he was hopping. Really hopping. He thinks he broke his leg. Stanton and Lafayette are thrilled. This means the guy no one has seen yet needed a doctor and fast. It's a huge clue. And with that, Union Cavalry appear at Dr. Mudd's home. It's Lutheran Byron Baker, who we met earlier in the episode. Luther shows Mudd a picture of Booth. Mudd, a doctor, plays dumb, admitting he said a broken leg, but the guy was clean shaven. I mean, it could be the Booth man, but I didn't recognize him at the time. The guy was just passing through, so the good doctor didn't bother making an electronic medical record. Sorry, I mean a good old paper patient record. Baker asks some good questions. When did Mudd learn about the assassination? Mudd says in the morning paper, but when Baker pushes him, he changes it to say he isn't sure when he read the story or heard the news, and is now looking to the left and doing some major rapid eye blinking. We should ask the behavioral panel guys on YouTube, but I think looking to the left can often mean that the person is lying, as people look to the right when they're accessing their memory. The rapid blinking is often linked to feelings of guilt, too. He tries to joke around that a patient with a broken tibia couldn't read anything more than a liquor bottle, so yeah, his patient didn't read the paper. Luther isn't amused. Mud continues to play dumb, which just isn't a good look from someone who medically and surgically treats people. Mary overhears all of this, but it's her brother William that runs into something as Luther is walking away. Realizing there are African Americans in the house, Luther asks William if he's loyal to Mud or if he can be trusted to tell the truth. Mary jumps into the scene, which gets her brother out of answering the question. Mud says Luther can ask Mary anything because she's bright, unlike her brother. As Luther asks her several questions from outside the door, Dr. Mud is inside the door giving threatening looks to Mary. This guy will seriously kill her if she talks. When Mary is asked if she knew John Mulk's booth murdered the president, she does her best not to lose it, but you can see the fear and realization that the guy who held a blade to her throat earlier was actually a murderer. As Luther walks away, Mud tells Luther he can use the water for his horses if he'd like. What a nice touch. Mud claps his hands for Mary and William to get back to work and said, it ain't Easter yet. This seems to confirm that all of this is happening on Saturday, April 15th. This is officially the longest, most productive day in history. If it seems unreal, it is. Mary goes into a room, and we flash back to her as a girl calling for her Uncle Henry. A white man comes out of the shadows, grabs her, and puts her in a wagon as she screams. Henry drops the firewood he has in his arms, but he walks with a cane, and there's nothing he can do. Back at the War Department, Eddie shows his father a photo from Lincoln's second inauguration. Sherlock Holmes picks up his magnifying glass, sorry, I meant Stanton, and he sees Booth on one of the balconies while Lincoln was giving his inauguration speech. Booth isn't amused. There's a flashback to where we see Abraham Lincoln, played by Hamish Linklater, working on his inauguration speech in Stanton's office. If you think it's odd that Lincoln is spending all of his time here, there was no Oval Office back then. His executive office wasn't the best environment, plus I feel Lincoln preferred to be around and interacting with people. Lincoln wants to speak the truth about slavery, and Stanton tells him that he's never been more loved. He needs to go for that truth, because if Lincoln doesn't say it, no one ever will. As Lincoln continues with his speech, we see Stanton with this complete look of awe and respect. In turn, Lincoln looks to him for approval, which he gets. I didn't say much about Lincoln in episode one, but I'll say it here. I think Hamish Linklater is a better Lincoln than Daniel Day-Lewis. There, I said it. I'm sure you'll disagree with me, but that's how I feel. Eddie snaps his father out of his flashback and tells him it's not his fault. Stanton says it's all right, but you can tell he feels partly to blame. At the White House, there's a celebration going on for Andrew Johnson. Stanton stands alone. You get the feeling these are not his people. His son Eddie comes in to say that they found the doctor who treated his leg, but Booth left that morning so they don't have him. Stanton asks if there was another man with him, but Eddie doesn't know. 
Stanton leaves the room and runs into Elizabeth Keckley, who is about to join Mary Lincoln upstairs. Stanton asks where the first family is going to go. Just a thought, that nickname wasn't used until the Kennedy administration, but I guess it's meant to show his priority and loyalty to the Lincoln family. Elizabeth says they're going to Chicago and she is going with them. The thing is, Mary Lincoln is greatly in debt and it's really serious. She doesn't know how Mary is going to survive. Abraham didn't know, so they both give a huge sigh of relief that he would never know about how Mary spent the last few years spending away in an effort to keep her mind off of her grief and distress. Elizabeth says Mary can sell some of her gowns and jewelry, but it won't be nearly enough. She asks if Congress could create a widow's fund, because remember, this is the first time a president has been assassinated on the job, or at any point, but they are out of session. Stanton will see what he can do. Outside Stanton's home, we see his wife Ellen blowing out a lantern on a window ledge as she prepares for bed. Union soldiers are outside the home, which is weird because I thought Stanton declined security, and the soldiers think they hear something. They look around but completely miss the dark-haired gentleman who is just outside her window. Creepy. It seems like a hard thing to miss. At the White House, a man from Georgia is congratulating Johnson, saying they're looking forward to working with him. Johnson welcomes him back into the Union. If this is supposed to be a congressional member, this is completely wrong, as none of the Confederate states were allowed representation until 1867 at the earliest. I know General William Tecumseh Sherman showed Georgia who was boss last year, but I don't think they're eligible to be United States citizens again. They definitely aren't eligible to have a seat in the Union Congress. <sighs> anyway, Johnson gives a speech, let the coward run off into obscurity, he states as his guests clap in agreement. Stanton, lingering in the corner away from everyone, interrupts and asks Johnson if he really means that. Johnson snipes back to Stanton like he's some little kid, saying, the adults at the table would like to move on. Stanton points out that if we don't draw a line over murdering a president, then they all need to admit there is no line. Good point. He toasts to the president, and while others give cheers for Johnson, Stanton whispers that he really needs to be careful about challenging him on his hunt for Booth, unless he wants the whole country asking who had the most to gain from Lincoln's death. I think Johnson gets the message. It's nighttime at the War Department, and Eddie tells his father that there was someone outside of their home, and they left footprints. Stanton asks for the file of John Surratt Jr., as his application would have included his shoe size. I once worked in HR for a company that was over 100 years old, and there were records from decades back where the women applying for jobs had to include their measurements. I'm glad to see this was the practice back in the 1860s for the guys. Well, that's if it was true. And it might be, but John Surratt lurking outside their home is not. And if you hadn't guessed, Stanton goes home with a shoe of John Jr.'s size, and it's a perfect Cinderella fit. The reporter that Stanton met at Ford's in episode one is now meeting with Detective Baker. Baker gives him a huge pile of money and tells him to go to Montreal, Canada as a reporter and find out what the secret Confederate community knows about the assassination and the financing plots against America. The reporter gladly takes it, as he also mentions that he has seen Booth and Surratt up there before. Speaking of John Surratt Jr., there he is knocking on Mudd's door. We are still on the day that Lincoln died. Mary opens it, and John immediately flirts with her like she's a piece of candy he's drooling over. He tells Mudd he wished he had sold Mary to him, but Lincoln ruined all that. Mary surely doesn't feel the same way. Mudd asks if John has any symptoms, and John says no, just my usual. Honestly, are they going to play like John is a legit patient? Mary is much smarter than that, so it just seems kind of useless. While Mary is to go prep the room, Mudd asks Surratt if he knew the plan had changed, but John Jr. basically brushes him off and refuses to give Mudd any feedback. As Mary prepares the room, she finds a cut boot under the bed. She looks at it, and inside are the initials J.W.B. It was cut off when Booth had his broken leg set. She smartly hides it back under the bed before the men come upstairs. Mud tells Mary to get John the good provisions in the morning, whatever those are. Alone in the bedroom, John said he hears they are looking for him. Mud says he hears the War Department has nothing on nobody, and looks for John to validate. He won't. 
it is finally day two, it's Easter Sunday, and Stanton is visiting William Seward at his home to tell him Lincoln has died. Seward said he knew he was dead when Lincoln didn't come by to check on him. It's actually a very sad story in real life, so look for it in the Facts vs. Fiction video I'll be putting out later this week. Seward tells Stanton to be careful, after which Stanton asks if he thinks they will come for him again. Seward says they will. Looks like we won't find out, though, who they are in this episode. Stanton then goes into work, and his son Eddie has the most brilliant plan. A Lincoln train whistle stop tour. Have Lincoln on a train, stopping at all the major northern cities so people can see their loss up close and really feel it. It kind of feels Barnum and Bailey-ish to me, but Stanton is enormously proud of his son for thinking of such a great propaganda event. But I side with what they're trying to do, so I'm okay with it. Stanton asks Eddie where Lincoln should be buried. Eddie says Springfield, Illinois, and his dad thinks he's a genius. Yes, take him home. Stanton goes off to Planet. It will be a huge news event that will keep Lincoln in the news to overshadow Booth. On her way to the market to get John Jr. provisions, Mary sees the wanted poster of Booth nailed to a tree, showing him with his mustache. $30,000 reward. Booth and Harold are on horseback racing towards a house. A shirtless and very muscular Oswell Swan comes out with guns blazing, literally. Booth asks to talk to his owner, but he's out of luck. This man is the owner. Booth's head falls down and to the side. Oh, the defeat. Swan tells Booth and Harold they can close their jaws because he was born free. They ask for help to Rich Hill, and it's a great scene where the guys want to haggle, so Swan just keeps increasing his price. I like this guy, but then I remember Mud said Swan was on their side. The rain is pouring down, and we see the funeral train with people lining the platform to say goodbye. A single cello plays Amazing Grace in the background, which is perfection. Stanton meets Elizabeth Keckley again to wish her well and to give her a travel stipend for Mary. He hopes she doesn't spend it on luxuries to distract herself. Stanton can tell Elizabeth is torn about something, and when he simply says her name, she tells him that they can't go backwards. It took her 29 years to buy her freedom, and she will not be anyone's slave again. Stanton understands. She ends by saying, you be well, Edwin. He would want that. Mary Lincoln now makes her way up to the train, and Edwin greets her and begins to apologize for yelling at her that horrible night. She cuts him off, saying, It's okay, they both loved him. Find the man who killed my husband, she says, before stepping into the train. Here's one of the two Lincoln sons, Robert Lincoln. He and Stanton simply shake hands as he moves on. The Lincoln's youngest son, Tad, looks like he's being left out of this story, which is a huge shame. Then we see Eddie, and Stanton tells him to come home safe. I was kind of getting tired of Eddie relaying everything to everyone all the time, so maybe we'll get a break from him next week, unless they have Lincoln's funeral procession take a day or something. Which, at this point, I'm expecting it. Stanton looks on as his commander-in-chief's funeral train pulls away. I'm not crying, you're crying. Back in Maryland, Booth is having a hard time with the idea of paying a free black man to lead them to Rich Hill. He pays Swan eventually, but immediately Harold doesn't like the route as it takes them through the swamp. And remember, Harold is supposed to know the Maryland countryside pretty well. Swan tells them that one way is the swamp, and the other way is a Union soldier station. Yeah, looks like it will be the swamp. Oh, but before they take off, Swan wants their guns. Ugh, oh, Booth really doesn't like that. A church bell chimes, and Swan notifies them it's the end of the liturgy. They better give them their guns so they can make it past the church before people start leaving. When Booth doesn't move, Swan starts to leave before Booth then tells him to stop and points a revolver at him. Where did Booth get that? After a tense few seconds, he flips the gun around so Swan can grab it by the handle. Booth says a crude line that I can't repeat about Swan being their salvation. Harold gives his gun to Swan, and then they are off like horses at a Kentucky Derby, racing past the buggies and wagons outside the church. And just like that, we fade to the credits. My goodness, this was long. I am so sorry, but this episode had a ton of things in it that I believe are going to be related to future episodes. Otherwise, 
If they aren't, then I don't know what, what the heck this was. Hopefully this video will help some viewers out. I hate to say it, but almost every scene in this episode was manipulated in some way. It was often condensed into an unrealistic timeline or just complete fiction. Sometimes it was a blend of reality with fiction. They have given five to six people the roles that were handled by dozens, if not hundreds of men and women. There's just not much in here that I can say, yeah, that happened that way on that day. No changes. I'm not sure where they're going from here, but I'm worried they have lost viewers with this episode. If you want to hear me dissect this episode into what's fact and what's fiction, as I mentioned, there's a lot of fiction and a, a lot of manipulation in this episode, please subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss those future videos. I'll also be putting out a spotlight video in the next few weeks on the Lincoln Tomb in Springfield, Illinois, where I go into better detail about what happened to the Lincoln family after Abraham's death and the big mess over where Abraham was to be put to rest. It's literally Mary Lincoln versus the town of Springfield. I will also be recapping next week's episode titled Let the Sheep Flee. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, I bid you an affectionate farewell.